This is the second part of the Animal Chiropractic Lecture on Ethics and Legalities. Uh, before I move on to the next topic, I want to reflect for a minute on the topic of supervision and the interaction between veterinarians and chiropractors in providing animal chiropractic care. Uh, sometimes as I go through that lecture, it's easy to get bogged down in the details of some of the state regulations which really are, for 50 different states, they're all over the place or they're non-existent. So sometimes it's difficult to figure out what the best thing to do is. But generally I think the best strategy is for both veterinarians and chiropractors to approach this with a team approach. Uh, veterinarians should recognize that there are areas of expertise and experience where chiropractors know more about animal chiropractic than a veterinarian may know. But I also think it's important for the chiropractors to recognize that there are areas of expertise where the veterinarians have far more training and far more abilities or, or access to uh, uh, facilities to provide better care for animals. So it's important for each profession as, the, as they move forward to recognize when they should involve members of the other profession. Now, above and beyond that, of, of what I think is best, I also think it's a good practice to follow whatever the state rules are, even when the state rules may not make a lot of sense. Um, it's important to follow those rules, and I think the best hope of getting these states to adopt more common sense rules or better rules for the protection of the patients and the clients is for the two professions, veterinarians and chiropractors, to work together, uh, to work together in a way that makes sense and to respect each other's different skills and expertise so that the animals receive the best care. And that will help alleviate the concerns of the states uh, uh, that chiropractors may not be as qualified as they should be to be caring for animals. I also think as the two professions work together, the veterinary profession will begin to recognize that animal chiropractic is not going to take away from their business or affect them negatively. It will probably have a, a positive effect by getting owners, clients more involved in the care for their animals. So that's kind of my last thought on, on supervision and, and I do think it's a difficult topic and a topic that requires some more development as the states develop regulations. Next topic I want to talk about is informed consent. Now both chiropractors and veterinarians are used to getting informed consent from their patients or their clients. And the strategy or, or the practice of informed consent generally is not any different for animal chiropractic except sometimes it gets a little more confusing. Uh, sometimes I think professionals will present the different alternatives to their clients and give their clients a lot of information and, and deliver it in a way that's not very useful to the client. So the client's not real sure how to decide what the best thing to do is. Reminded of George Bernard Shaw's quote, the single biggest problem with communication is the illusion it has taken place. Sometimes we think just because we've said the magic words, we've said what was supposed to be said. I think it's more important to be sure we communicate with clients in a way that is effective. And the only way to make sure the communication is effective is to have a dialogue with the client. Questions and answers. If they're unable to ask questions or they're unable to answer your questions, that means they didn't get the information. And maybe you need to th rethink how it's delivered. Now don't insult them by repeating the same information in exactly the same way, but try to communicate, <laughs> communicate it in a way that's a little bit different and a little bit more effective for them. Uh, informed consent is an educational process. Uh, too many doctors I think look at it as, as just meaning I got the right form signed and I've got it in the file so things are good. I think it's important to look at it and understand that informed consent is not just a signature on a form, it's the opportunity for the animal chiropractor to explain to the client what the benefits 
of for or for animal chiropractic what animal chiropractic is all about what's involved in it and what's not involved in it now of course it also means to help the client make an educated decision that the doctor will need to disclose some things that may not work or some limitations or risk associated with animal chiropractic one of the benefits of doing this well is it will improve doctor patient relationships so that the clients will trust their doctor and be less likely to turn around and sue their doctor. Informed consent also helps to protect doctors from malpractice claims. Uh, failing to get informed consent places the doctor in a very unfortunate situation when it comes to malpractice. So I always like to ask at this point, why do doctors fail to get good informed consent? I think there's a couple reasons for it. I think one reason is it can be time consuming and I do agree that especially with a new patient and a new client it will take some time to educate them and communicate. Now I don't think it should take hours but it may take 10, 15, 20 minutes to communicate it effectively uh, what's going on. Now, it doesn't have to be a 20 minute session all at once. It may be broken out at different times during that initial patient visit and it may be all conducted by the doctor or it may be conducted uh, uh, by other staff members uh, and I know that some doctors even do it through uh, uh, watching having the uh, client watch a videotape although I don't think that's the best or most effective way to communicate this information. The uh, um, other risk or, or other reason that I think doctors fail to get informed consent is I think they're afraid that if they really tell the client what's going on and they sit down and list all the bad things that can happen then it means the client's going to make a decision to not go forward with the care. I think generally if the risk are put in perspective you know there are benefits and there are risk uh, the risk are not going to frighten clients unless it really is not the decision or a risk that the client wishes to take. And there may be situations where the client's weight weighing of the uh, uh, benefits and risk may be different from the way the doctor would weigh the benefits and the risk. And the doctor should respect that decision uh, and, and may want to rethink how they communicate with the patient, whether they could communicate those benefits more effectively. Uh, informed consent is important because it respects the client's freedom of choice, the opportunity to choose between traditional veterinary care and animal chiropractic care is critical to the growth of this profession and it becomes meaningless to have the opportunity to make that choice if you don't have the information to make a, a good choice. Uh, informed consent is about educating the client not just the bad things that can happen but the good things that can happen as well the benefits of animal chiropractic. Uh, informed consent gives the doctor a chance to demonstrate their honesty and their trustworthiness. Being willing to be honest with the client and explain to the client that things don't always go well or that there may be risk involved in a particular treatment or a particular condition can be very helpful in building the client's trust in the doctor. And as I mentioned before, building that doctor-patient, doctor-client rapport is, is critical. Uh, certainly the studies dealing with human malpractice claims against MDs make it very clear that when patients trust their doctors, when patients like their doctors, they don't turn around and sue the doctor even though they've had a bad result. Um, on the other hand, when the patients don't trust the doctor, or they have the feeling that the doctor is in it only to make money, then the patients are more likely to turn around and sue the doctors. Now, I think the same rationale will apply to clients as well as to those patients. If the clients like and trust the doctor, they're not going to be inclined to sue them. And certainly the malpractice lawyers who represent injured people uh, can almost all testify or, or tell you that this is a truthful statement. Patients don't call those lawyers and say I really like and trust my doctor but I want to sue him anyway. They call the 
malpractice lawyers and say my doctor lied to me, my doctor won't return my phone calls, uh, my doctor didn't communicate with me effectively, uh, and sometimes the doctor may not communicate at all with the patient. And those are the situations where the doctor is most at risk. And you can help avoid that by spending really only just a few minutes with a new client to make sure you've got a good relationship where they trust you and like you. The other benefit of informed consent is it does help protect the doctor from liability. Just going through the process helps the client to accept some responsibility so that when things go wrong or if they go wrong, the client understands that that was a risk that they decided to take and they don't feel compelled or any uh, uh, reason to go sue the doctor. They understood that was a possibility and they're okay with, with the end result in that situation. The other way it protects you from liability is if you fail to get informed consent, you fail to disclose the risk involved. The doctor becomes liable for bad results even if the doctor did everything else correctly. So it's important to take the time to build this relationship and to get good informed consent. Now, a number of states, including Texas, have, I shouldn't say a number of states, several states, including Texas, do have regulations for animal chiropractic that specifically address the need to obtain informed consent about animal chiropractic, including the disclosure that it's an alternative to traditional veterinary care and in most cases disclosing what that traditional veterinary care might be and the risk and benefits of that care so that again the client can make an educated decision. Uh, this slide is the uh, section out of the Texas Administrative Code. Uh, one thing I will tell you is it requires that the veterinarian have as part of their permanent record of the patient a signed statement by the client consenting to animal chiropractic care. And I think both professionals, the veterinarians and the chiropractors, should work together to make sure that that signed statement uh, gets into the file of the veterinarian. Uh, one thing I do know is that when the Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners is reviewing uh, veterinarians or investigating claims against veterinarians, they look for those signed statements. That's one of the things that they're going to look for, and if it's not there, they're likely to impose some kind of sanction against the veterinarian. So just be sure it's there and, and chiropractors be sure it's there for your veterinarian so you can help protect them from any risk. Now this sample consent form in the, the PowerPoint slide you can ignore. If you look at the last page of the uh, PowerPoint slides there is a, let's see if I can pull it up here for you, there is a, a revised consent form or a referral form from veterinarians to chiropractors for animal chiropractic care and it demonstrates the consent of the client and the veterinarian and I think it's a good idea to use a form, not necessarily this form, but some form, some written document that demonstrates that the chiropractor and the veterinarian are working together and what is the role of the veterinarian and what is the role of the chiropractor. Um, now this I, I drafted intentionally to comply with the Texas rules. It may or may not comply with the rules of other states. And I will also tell you that most states do not have any specific rules on this topic. So be sure you uh, uh, adapt a form, whether it's this one or another one, adapt a form that reflects the way you conduct your practice and helps you conduct it efficiently, but also helps document that the veterinarian, the client, and the chiropractor are all communicating and working together for the best interest of the patient. So these are basically the requirements of the Texas rule. The consent form must be signed by the client, must be dated, should identify the chiropractor and the veterinarian. It can either be a standalone form or it can be included in a general contract with the client. Uh, when consent is obtained by telephone, uh, I recommend strongly that that consent be verified in writing as soon as possible. Even if the writing is nothing more than a quick letter from the doctor 
saying, Dear client, I want to confirm our telephone conversation. In that conversation, we discussed animal chiropractic for your animal, and you consented to that treatment. It's also helpful when you're depending on telephone consent to uh, have it confirmed by a second witness. If you have a staff member working with you, it's usually pretty simple to hand the phone to the staff member, you know, explain to the client that you're going to have the staff member take a more detailed message from them, and then have the staff member take a message to confirm the consent to animal chiropractic care. Now, if there's any fight about it or dispute about it later, or the client's memory becomes less clear, uh, it gives the veterinarian or the chiropractor a chance to present two witnesses that they received that verbal or oral consent. Now, before I move away from the topic of informed consent, I want to talk for a few minutes about what doctors should do when things go wrong. Informed consent is all about communicating, and informed consent is about communicating before the treatment occurs and before things go wrong. I think the next thing to think about, and hopefully this never happens to any of you, but I suspect it will, the second thing to think about is how to communicate to the client when things don't come out the way you expect. I mean, the first thing to do is to avoid panic. And I know it's easy to say that and difficult to do it in the heat of the moment, but as a professional, it is important for you to be able to step back and, and set the tone for your staff and other people around you that this is not a panic situation. You want to move quickly if quick movement is going to be in the best interest of the patient. But you don't want to be panicked where you freeze or don't know or, or, or aren't able to think clearly about the decisions you need to be making. Now remember the most important thing when something's going wrong is to care for the patient. What can you do to help the patient as best as possible? Um, once you've composed yourself and you've cared for the patient, do a little bit of investigation to try to figure out what went wrong. Now if it happened in your presence and you're aware of what get what went wrong, that may be a very short investigation. But even if you need to ask other people what happened or what they were doing when this when when the bad result occurred, uh, don't try to stretch it out. Uh, that needs to be a fairly quick investigation at this point because you want to be able to communicate to the client. And, and if the communication is, you know, we're not really sure what went wrong or what happened, but we'll continue to look into it, that can be helpful as well. But if you can get a pretty good idea of what went wrong, it, it helps to communicate to the client, here's why this bad result happened. Uh, the next thing after you've, you've got an idea of what happened is to disclose it to the client. And on the next slide, I'll talk for a few minutes about how you ought to disclose these things to clients. Uh, you need to flat out tell them what happened. And if it's a bad result, you need to tell them pretty directly and not beat around the bush. You need to think about whether it's appropriate to apologize and whether you're willing to make an apology at that point. Uh, one thing, again, that comes out of the medical malpractice world is a, an understanding that if the doctor who made a mistake comes forward soon after the bad event and apologizes in an appropriate manner, that patient, that injured person, is less likely to file a malpractice lawsuit. On the other hand, if the medical doctor avoids taking responsibility for the bad result, avoids being accountable for what they may have done, that's a situation where you almost always have a malpractice lawsuit. And think about the difference between these kinds of apologies and the effect they may have on your client. Uh, I'm sorry this happened to you and your pet. Uh, using carefully worded, carefully selected lawyerly words to avoid admitting any responsibility. Express empathy without accepting responsibility. Uh, I'm sorry this mistake happened. Again, carefully wording it where it may not have been my mistake. Maybe somebody else did it. Maybe it was or wasn't my responsibility. But I'm not taking responsibility for it in this apology. Versus the last one, I'm sorry that I or my team made this mistake. Taking clear responsibility for the mistake, 
uh, hopefully coupling it with an explanation of how you're going to prevent the mistake from happening again in the future um, and and providing the patient or the client with some explanation of what happens next uh, is there malpractice insurance you probably don't want to disclose the policy limits but you may want to disclose to your, your client that if you made a mistake and, and uh, uh, it's appropriate you may want to disclose that you're going to re report it to your malpractice carrier and they may contact the patient or the client directly uh, now certainly before you make one of these apologies I also recommend that you if you have time take a minute to contact your malpractice carrier most insurance companies have figured out that making this kind of apology can be very valuable and the risk of accepting responsibility at this early stage is pretty slim uh, sometimes the the acceptance of responsibility isn't going to be disputed to begin with and sometimes accepting responsibility at this point may be uh, changed by facts that are learned after this after, after this time so it's something that there is some risk involved in accepting responsibility but it's a relatively small risk at this point and it does have a very soothing effect very comforting effect on your client uh, if you were able to come forward and say I'm sorry that I made this mistake uh, if the patient will need continuing care you ought to discuss with the client the plan of care for the patient you know what continuing care will the patient probably need um, and how will that be provided or when will that be provided uh, the doctor if possible should be accountable now sometimes at the early stages you may not be able to accept clear responsibility and it may be a simple discussion of, of I'm going to be reporting this to my malpractice carrier uh, and I will will work with them to see what we can do to make things right um, and, and work with your your client that way uh, and then lastly I also think it's important if there's a step to take to prevent this kind of thing from happening in the future uh, discuss with your client what you're going to do to protect other animals in the future that also I think has a great soothing effect on clients uh, many times when people file lawsuits they will at least explain that they really don't care about trying to get money out of the doctor or the hospital what they really want is to make sure this kind of treatment this kind of mistake doesn't happen again in the future and if you can start talking fairly early with them about how you're going to make sure this doesn't happen again or, or, or reduce the risk of it happening that can go a long way to helping discourage or help steer the patient away from the idea that they ought to see the doctor now as we talk about these I, I hope that almost all of this if not all of it is pretty common sense information but I also think it's important to remind yourself from time to time what you would do when a bad result occurs sometimes when you panic or in the heat of the moment you may not do things very well you may react with anger towards your staff or the client you may react out of frustration with yourself or your limitations or you may you may react in a number of inappropriate ways but if you thought about how to react appropriately and how to to communicate effectively you reduce the risk of having a bad result blow up into a malpractice lawsuit a uh, few quick guidelines for disclosure uh, number one choose a quiet place now in a uh, uh, in an office setting that's usually pretty easy to handle but I know that sometimes you may be treating animals in in barns or you may be treating animals at, at uh, uh, livestock or animal shows in those situations instead of trying to have this kind of conversation with your client in, in a, a public place where lots of other people can hear and where there's lots of distractions going on try to get the client to a, a, a location that's quiet where you can have a serious discussion with them uh, protect yourself from distractions if you have a cell phone turn it off not on vibrate turn it off if you have staff with you make sure your staff understands they should not be interrupting you until this conversation is finished whatever else is going on we'll just have to wait a few minutes as you sit down with the client or, or even as you're arranging the meeting you may want to let the client know that you've got some difficult news to share with them give them a little bit of a warning now they may know this already and that may be unnecessary 
but if they don't know that a bad result has occurred, start by letting them know that it's difficult news, and then be fairly straightforward in explaining to them what went wrong and what the result was. Just good common sense uh, uh, communication is to pay attention to the nonverbal messages that you send. Make eye contact with your client. Look them in the eye. Okay, making an apology while you stare at your shoes really is not very effective. But making an apology while you're looking someone in the eye, taking responsibility for what happened, if that's appropriate, is far more effective way to communicate. Uh, it's a best practice to sit at the client's level. Don't have the client sit down and then stand over them. You want to be at the same level so that you're communicating most directly and you're not trying to communicate that you have some kind of power or authority over the client. It's also important to pay attention to your client's nonverbal cues. If the client needs a moment to compose themselves, you should pick up on that and give them a moment. If they need a few minutes to process what's going on, to think about what's going on, try to give them that opportunity. Now, it may be the opportunity for that happens after you leave the room, but don't try to rush through this because you've got a bunch of people in the waiting room or you've got other places you would rather be. When you're here for this conversation, there should be nothing else that you are thinking about. There should be nothing else drawing on your attention. There should be nothing else distracting you. This conversation is important to you. It is important to your client. As the professional, you should facilitate discussion and ask questions and answer questions as appropriate. Uh, don't just sit down and, and read a lecture to the, your client in this situation. Talk to them about what happened and get them involved in that communication process. And that's going to help you understand what their thinking is and where they are. And then lastly, when, when possible, uh, finish the discussion with a plan for when you will communicate again. Many times these malpractice lawsuits start out when the doctor stops returning the client's phone calls. Take the time to communicate. If they call you, try to call them back within a reasonable time. And be careful that you don't add another level of anger to what may already be a bad situation. few quick comments on advertising. As I think I mentioned during the first lecture, the advertising rules are really all over the board. Basic rule is that advertising has to be truthful and honest, cannot be false, misleading, or deceptive. And I think every state pretty much starts out, every board pretty much starts out with that very basic rule. And then what happens is, is different professionals will try to find ways to uh, stretch the limits of that rule, test the boundaries. And as they do that, they will engage in different kinds of advertising practices, different kind of promises, different kinds of strategies, and the boards react to those, those events. They react in a way, if, if they approve it, then they don't do anything with the rule. If they don't approve of that kind of advertising, then they will adopt a rule that says that kind of advertising is bad. The other thing that's important as we talk about advertising is how chiropractors can advertise about treating animals. Now I want you to think about a couple things here. Should it be okay to offer to treat animals? And is that offer the practice of veterinary medicine? Would it be misleading for a chiropractor to advertise that they provide animal chiropractic care? Is it misleading to advertise prescription products directly to the public? Okay, anybody that's watched TV knows that that happens. And the question here is whether it's appropriate for a chiropractor to advertise that they will treat animals with animal chiropractic. Most of the states have rules, and those rules define uh, practice of veterinary medicine as including holding yourself out to the public 
as being available to treat animals, to diagnose, treat, etc. And, and that's true of other professions as well. And the question here is whether it is a violation or practice without a license for a chiropractor to advertise that they will see animals and will treat animals. And I think the answer is, in most states, the Veterinary Board of Medical Examiners will find that that's practice without a license. Now, I think the rule makes no sense. I think there should be a, a way for chiropractors to advertise honestly to make the public aware of their services. Now, it would be appropriate to require those advertisements include disclosures that the uh, chiropractor will not see patients without a referral from a veterinarian or without supervision of a veterinarian. But what we've created here, what the states have created here, is a, a, a situation that makes it very difficult for chiropractors to educate the public about their services for animal chiropractic. And that's not a, a good situation for a number of reasons. Um, and it probably needs to be something that the, the boards will address or should address in the near future. But as a chiropractor working in today's environment with one of these regulations in place, I got to tell you the only way you're going to be able to advertise is through a veterinarian. You know, something like a, a web page that's connected to a veterinarian's web page where the veterinarian says we provide animal chiropractic and we refer to this doctor of chiropractic to provide that care and then maybe some information about the animal chiropractor, the, the chiropractor there. Um, if the chiropractor places that kind of web page on their own or places an advertisement like that on their own, it's, it's likely to be seen. Let's face it, the whole point of advertising is for people to look at it. And one of the people who is going to look at it is the veterinarian who is very suspicious of animal chiropractic and certainly suspicious of chiropractors practicing veterinary medicine without a license. So those those unhappy people are going to turn around and report it to the state board. And the state board will look at it and if this is what their rules say, that chiropractor is practicing veterinary medicine without a license. So they need to think carefully about how they place that advertisement and make sure it's being placed by somebody who is licensed to treat animals not by a, a chiropractor who can treat animals only through referral or under supervision. So I'm going to take a few minutes here and talk about malpractice claims. Most of this is a very basic discussion of malpractice. Uh, for all of you, uh, both chiropractors and veterinarians, this should be information you're already pretty familiar with. But again, I think it's helpful to remind yourself or be reminded about some of these, these issues. Uh, so that you can be better prepared. Uh, the first thing I've got for you, is, it, for the chiropractors at least, is very good news. The risk of being sued for malpractice when you're treating animals is much, much lower than the risk of being sued for malpractice when you're treating humans. Now, when we talk about damages, you'll understand why that's so. The damages are so low that it's un, it, it just doesn't make as much sense to pursue these claims. Uh, few quick uh, uh, trends that are out there. Uh, when you're working with horses is when you are most exposed to malpractice. Some of those horses are very valuable and that's when the damages can be much higher and that's when it is riskier or, or you have the greatest exposure to malpractice claims. The uh, AVMA's uh, insurance trust uh, reports based on their claims that they spend nearly as much on legal fees defending these claims as they spend paying for the claims, which tells you a lot about the value of the claims. The other thing it tells you is that from the perspective of the lawyer representing the injured, uh, representing the client with the injured patient, that lawyer's not going to make much money. And that is probably one of the reasons that we see so few veterinary malpractice claims. Uh, but they also note that when humans are injured, perhaps because an animal is not restrained properly, when humans around the animals get injured, 
that is a growing area of claims and that can be very those claims can be very expensive to resolve so make sure you do take appropriate steps two basic types of claims uh, in these situations one would be based on breach of contract the other would be based on negligence sometimes they may be combined but usually they're a little bit separate and the reason I want to tell you about the difference between these two claims is that in order to win a negligence claim the clients attorney will have to hire expert witnesses in almost every case and the cost of hiring those expert witnesses will often exceed the amount of damages and there's no way to recover the cost of hiring those expert witnesses it has to be paid out of the damage award if or out of the lawyers pocket uh, so as a result if the only claim against you is based on negligence you're in a better situation uh, the four elements of a negligence claim and we'll, we'll talk about these in more detail in a minute but first that the doctor owed a duty to the client and the patient second that the doctor breached that duty they provided care that did not meet the standard of care third that that breach of duty approximately caused damages there has to be a reasonable connection between the mistake made by the doctor and the damages that are incurred and then lastly there have to be damages if the doctor makes a mistake but nothing bad happens there's no claim for malpractice if you think about the world of animal chiropractic most of the time it's almost impossible to have a bad result that causes damages uh, uh, it can happen but it's extremely rare I've, I've not heard of many many cases involving that uh, the other type of claim besides a negligence claim is a breach of contract claim now to win a negligence claim I'm going to need an expert witness to show what the standard of care is and to show proximate cause that caused damages for a breach of contract claim the 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 client with the injured patient merely has to show that there is a valid contract there were promises made that the client did what they were supposed to do they tendered performance and that the doctor breached the contract uh, the doctor promised a result and that result didn't occur doctor promised they would do something for some reason they didn't do what they promised to do and then the last element is that damages result now look at the difference between these two claims to prove a contract claim probably does not require an expert witness what did the parties promise that may be reflected in a written agreement or a series of emails or or simply the clients verbal recollection of what was said and promised uh, that the client did what they were supposed to do they can testify on their own that they did that that the doctor failed didn't do what they promised to do again the client can make that testimony in almost every case all by themselves uh, so the cost of pursuing a breach of contract claim is much much less than pursuing a claim for negligence the other thing to know about a breach of contract claim is that in addition to recovering the damages the client may also have an opportunity to recover the amount of attorneys fees that they spent so that it gives them kind of a it's it's a less expensive claim and there's a better upside so as you make promises with clients as you enter contracts with clients you want to be careful that you protect yourself as much as you can so that you aren't subject to a breach of contract or a breach of warranty claim if you're going to be subject to a claim you want to do your best to be sure the only claim the client can allege is based on negligence or carelessness of course you want to avoid that kind of claim too but we'll talk about that next Okay, the first element in a claim for negligence is breach of is that a duty is owed. Uh, generally, we have a duty to act towards other people in a way that a reasonable, prudent person would act under like or similar circumstances. Now, that may be adjusted depending on the level of expertise or education that the person has. So, for example, a veterinarian should act as a reasonable, prudent veterinarian somewhat higher standard than just a reasonable prudent person if you hold yourself out as an expert in animal chiropractic 
either as a veterinarian or as a chiropractor, you may upgrade that, that duty even further to a duty to act as a reasonable, prudent animal chiropractor, chiropractic veterinarian, uh, uh, etc. So think about how you hold yourself out to your, your clients. It doesn't mean you shouldn't tell them that you practice animal chiropractic, but if you boast about your expertise, you may increase your duties. The duty occurs once the doctor-patient-client relationship is created. Uh, doctor-client relationship can be created either by expressly accepting the client and the patient or by exercising independent professional judgment for the benefit of the client and the patient. Express acceptance is usually pretty clear. Typically that happens when a, a client and the patient are in your office, you've got a file going, you're, you're, you expect to be paid for your services. But sometimes you can create a, a doctor-patient-client relationship in a situation where you don't intend to by simply exercising or expressing your opinions based on your independent professional judgment. Now, it may be a phone call where the doctor or a member of the doctor's staff shares information with a client about what they think a diagnosis is or what they think the best treatment for an animal is. And that simple discussion can create a doctor-patient-client relationship where the doctor owes a duty of reasonable care towards that client and the patient. It can also happen in social situations. Uh, I don't know about your experience, but I know that every time I get introduced to other people as a lawyer, I immediately, almost always, start to get questions about things like, what about this contract? What about this traffic ticket? What do you think I should tell my brother to do about this? Now I have to be circumspect in how I answer those questions because once I start answering those questions I create an attorney-client relationship if I express my professional judgment. So it's, it's careful, you need to be careful how you communicate in those social situations and if you need more information to express a, a, an opinion that you're willing to stand behind I encourage you to respond to those questions by simply saying that this isn't the right place or time to discuss that but if you'll make an appointment with my office we'll get you in as quick as we can and take a look at your 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 animal and, and see what we can do. Now the risky part about both of these situations phone calls and social situations and social media as well is you may create a doctor client patient relationship without realizing it. You may create the relationship with somebody who has never been to your office. You may have no documentation ever about that relationship and you may never be paid for any of the services or opinions that you provided. But you still have liability or could still have liability in malpractice if your care, your opinions, were not the kinds of opinions that a reasonable prudent uh, veterinarian would render. Uh, last point on here is your staff. Your staff can also create doctor-client-patient relationships if they express those kinds of opinions as your employee. So be careful that you train your staff about what they should and should not say to prospective clients. And generally the best advice is, is to be very clear that the patient, the animal, needs to be examined by the doctor and they need to make an appointment to bring the animal in or for the doctor to see the animal and that will be the time that the doctor client patient relationship is created and when the doctor can explain how they can help and if they can help. So that's the first element of a negligence claim, duty. The second element of a negligence claim is breach of duty. Once the duty is established the injured or, or the client with the injured patient must demonstrate that the doctor breached the standard of care. Now it can be a challenge to, I shouldn't say challenge, it can be expensive to demonstrate the standard of care. Uh, it's not something that a layperson can testify to. It usually means bringing an expert witness in 
who may charge thousands of dollars a day for their testimony, both in deposition and at trial. Uh, so it's a fairly expensive proposition to bring in an expert witness to testify that this is what a reasonable prudent veterinarian would have done and this is how the doctor failed to do that. Uh, keep in mind that the standard of care will change over time. It's important for you to stay current, especially in a profession as, as young as animal chiropractic. It's important to stay current. It's important to make sure you're using the most appropriate care for your patients. Uh, it's also important to keep in mind that specialists are usually held to a higher standard of care. The standard for a reasonable prudent specialist like an animal chiropractor is somewhat higher than the standard for a reasonable prudent veterinarian or reasonable prudent chiropractor. Uh, one area where the breach of duty can be shown is, is a failure to diagnose. And I want to point this out particularly for the chiropractors listening to this so that they're aware they need to be careful if they're not certain about the diagnosis uh, and they happen to be in a situation where they're not being supervised by a veterinarian, they should be quick to refer the client to a licensed veterinarian to have a more definitive diagnosis made. Now sometimes that may be a situation where you're seeing things in the examination that maybe don't make sense or aren't clear to you. Uh, it may be a situation where further testing needs to be done beyond what you can do as a chiropractor. Maybe situations where an animal is not responding to care the way you would expect them to respond. But don't be afraid to make that referral. That can be one of the best things you can do to protect yourself from a malpractice case. Uh, and the second area where, where breach of duty can be a, a, an issue is failure to restrain the animal. Now I know as part of this, this course you're going to receive some training on the best ways to restrain larger animals. But you need to think carefully about how to restrain those animals and you need to think carefully about whether the owner should be the one restraining the animals. Um, many times owners are, are very attached to their animals and they want to be right there especially if the animal isn't feeling well. Uh, they want to be right there with them. And sometimes it's okay. And sometimes the owner may have the skills in the size, physical size and strength to restrain the animal. But there are other situations where the owner may not have the experience, the skills or the physical strength to restrain the animal. And it's important for you as the doctor providing the care to be sensitive to that. Remember one of the growing areas of malpractice claims is for injuries to the humans around the animals. So be very conscious and, and this slide lists some of the times when you shouldn't use the owner to restrain the animal. If you can tell the animal is not under the owner's control, if the client is asking for help, or the client's not verbally asking for help, but you can tell by their body language that they're suffering from fear, inexperience, or incompetence in the restraint of the animals, or if the client just flat isn't big enough, uh, you know, especially a uh, uh, you know, teenagers may not be big enough to restrain a large animal. And also consider whether additional restraint is, is appropriate if you're about to perform a procedure that may cause pain to the patient or may startle the patient. Uh, animals when they get startled or are suffering from pain tend to act like animals and you may need to have appropriate restraints in place to keep them from hurting themselves and from hurting the people around them. So those are the first two elements you have to have a, of a negligence claim. There has to be a duty and there has to be a breach of that duty. Uh, third element is proximate cause. Now proximate cause is a fancy legal term that basically means there needs to be a connection between the breach of conduct, breach of, of duty rather, and the damages that occur. And that uh, 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 the, the two essential elements of proximate cause are, are that the damage has to be foreseeable. In other words, the doctor has to know, has to be reasonable for the doctor to expect when they make their mistake, that they should know that one consequence, one possible consequence, is the damages that actually occur. 
Uh, the second piece is there has to be a direct causal relationship between the breach and the damages. In other words, the situation can't be the doctor made this mistake, which caused situation X to happen, which caused situation Y to happen, which then caused the damages that we're suing for. It has to be a direct, the doctor made a mistake, and that caused these damages. And again, like I mentioned earlier, typically an expert witness is going to be required to testify to show the breach of duty, the standard of care, and the breach of duty, as well as the causal relation between that breach and the damages. So now let's spend a few minutes talking about the damages. The good news for working with animals is the damages are usually pretty small. If you're working on very valuable animals like racehorses, then, then that statement doesn't apply. But if you're working on typical animals, dogs and cats and, and pets, the value of those animals is so, so low that the uh, risk of malpractice is also very low because lawyers are not going to pursue these suits unless they think there's going to be a chance to make a reasonable recovery. Uh, when I say reasonable recovery, I mean recover enough money to compensate the lawyer for their time. Now, the first kind of damages that can be awarded are nominal damages. If the court finds the doctor was negligent and there really wasn't much, if any, damage, then the court may award a nominal amount of, you know, a dollar, ten dollars, or a hundred dollars just to, to send a message to the doctor and to create a record that the doctor did something wrong. Uh, obviously, nobody wants to pursue a lawsuit and the expense involved in the lawsuit and the time involved just for the sake of recovering nominal damages. Uh, second type of damages are compensatory damages. Uh, these are damages for the value of the damage. How do we make the injured person whole again? How do we compensate them for their injuries? Now, with the loss of an animal, the law generally looks at the animal as a piece of property, like a table or a chair, not as a member of the family. Okay, the, the amount of damages if you have a child who is killed are very different from the amount of damages if you have a dog who is killed by a doctor's negligence. Uh, damages are generally going to be based on the fair market value of that animal. I certainly know that there are some special breeds and purebreds that, that may be more valuable. Certainly there are larger animals like racehorses that are more valuable. But a typical dog is a mixed breed dog and is going to have a value of a few hundred dollars at the most. That's not very helpful. That's not a very compelling amount to encourage clients and lawyers to pursue these lawsuits. Now, the courts and the juries have struggled with this, this compensation because the, the law also allows recovery of special damages based on the unique value to the owner. And some juries and, and some trial courts look at that and say, well, that must mean the sentimental or the emotional value, the connection between the animal and its owner. Uh, and it, we'll walk through a few cases in a minute here, and there are some situations where the juries or trial courts are giving larger awards uh, based on that sentimental value. But I think the way the courts are interpreting that rule, at least so far, have been that special damages are, are talking about a unique value like a, a an animal that's a service animal, a seeing eye dog, and those special damages are the essentially the cost that was incurred to train that dog to perform those special tasks. That's a far cry from that sentimental value and it's going to be a much lower number. Uh, general damages would include damages for pain and suffering and emotional distress. And if you're dealing with a situation where a human has been injured, that may be a significant amount. But dealing with an injury to an animal many times in many states that may not be recoverable or even if it is it is a much lower amount the emotional suffering of the owner for losing their animal usually is not compensable uh, damages may also include consequential damages 
expenses like the ongoing medical care or veterinary care of the animal, uh, lost income if the animal was, was used to produce income, or loss of use if the animal provided a valuable service, again like a seeing eye or, or special needs dog, uh, and the cost to locate a substitute. Uh, sometimes that's not very difficult. Okay, if you think about an, a, a typical mixed breed dog from the pound, that's not going to be very much. But if you have a very specialized animal with very specialized skills, uh, that may cost more to find another dog to take, take the place or another animal to take the place. Uh, punitive damages are extremely rare. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, punitive damages get awarded, awarded in a very small percentage of cases and more often than not, even when it gets awarded then, it gets turned around by the Court of Appeals, overturned by the Court of Appeals. Punitive damages can be awarded only if the conduct was willful, malicious, intentional or fraudulent, or gross or wanton acts of negligence. Certainly it's possible to meet that standard. I think as a general rule, if you're going through practice and being reasonable about the way you're going through your practice, uh, that should not be a very significant or meaningful risk to you. So really the area that I want to talk about now is, is the compensatory damages. And, and where the courts have struggled and where I think we struggle as a society is how do we decide what the value of, of a pet, a family pet is? And do we assign a value to that sentimental value of the pet? Um, in the first case I'm going to talk about, uh, actually before I talk about this case, I'll, I'll tell you briefly the answer is the courts are not awarding value for that sentimental value, uh, at least not in cases that are standing up on appeal. Uh, so as that continues, assuming that continues, the risk of veterinary malpractice will continue to remain low. But if courts or as courts start to try to figure out a way to award damages for that sentimental value, you may see these awards become larger and it may become more attractive for lawyers and clients to pursue malpractice claims uh, and they may become more common. So pay attention to your state and what's going on in your state with respect to these rules. Uh, first case I want to talk about was decided by the Texas Supreme Court about two years ago, Strickland versus Medlin case. And if you look at this case, the, the facts of this case are about as bad as the facts of any case could be. Back in June of 2009, the, the owner's dog escaped from their backyard, was picked up by Fort Worth Animal Control. The owner came by to pick their animal up, their dog up at the, at the animal control but didn't have enough money with them that day to pick up the dog. The staff at the uh, animal control told the owner, that's okay, you can come back in a few days when you've got the money. The staff the shelter then put in a hold for owner tag on, the, on Avery's cage. Uh, unfortunately, the person who was making the list of animals to be euthanized failed to notice the hold for owner tag so they mistakenly euthanized Avery. Now the next mistake I think the shelter made is they didn't reach out to the owner to let them know that this mistake happened. Instead they waited a few days and when the owner showed up with his children to pick up their family pet that was when they told the owner that they had mistakenly euthanized the dog. Now you look at those facts and there's really no explanation, no, no good reasonable explanation for why the shelter did what they did. It was careless, it was a mistake, they should be liable for it. It's not going to take expensive experts to demonstrate that the shelter should not have euthanized the dog when it was marked hold for owner. Uh, this was about as simple of a case as you can be. And they went and tried the case to a jury. And the jury came back with a ver fairly large verdict against the shelter, or actually against the employee at the shelter. Uh, but the case was then appealed on to the Court of Appeals and to the uh, Texas Supreme Court. And if you read the Texas Supreme Court's opinion, when you start reading it, it, it sounds like the court is in a place where they're ready to say owners should be allowed to recover sentimental value. The first sentence in the, the opinion is, Texans love their dogs. The opinion talks about how 
People see their pets as family members. They take them on vacation. They're ready to risk their own lives to save their pets. Uh, and the, they also note that in America, we spent, in 2012, we spent $53 billion on our pets. They're valuable to us. They're important to us. And the court then comes back to the legal issue. The issue is whether the intrinsic or the sentimental value can be recovered for a pet dog. And although they, they recognize the special connection between people and their, their pets, and they recognize the closeness of pets to their human companions, they make a distinction between the worth of a pet and the value of a pet. And unfortunately, it, the way the law exists, the only thing you can recover for is the value of the pet. So the end result of the Strickland case was an award for a much smaller amount uh, than what the plaintiff was hoping for. Uh, another case where you can see the same type of uh, uh, situation is this Petco versus Schuster case. Uh, the owner took the dog to Petco for grooming and Petco lost the dog. So the owner sues Petco for damages. And the trial court awards about $40,000, which includes substantial amounts for emotional distress and intrinsic value uh, and exemplary damages. Court of Appeals looked at that and said, we're going to take that $40,000 judgment and we're going to reduce it. And when you look at how it got reduced, the damages to the client wound up being about $1,500 the replacement cost for the animal, uh, cost spent for training school for the dog, and the cost to microchip the dog. So the client receives about $1,500, but the court also awarded nearly $7,000 for the attorney's fees. Now, the reason they recovered attorney's fees is this case, unlike a negligence case, was based on a breach of contract. So there was a little bit of a recovery in this case, but it certainly was a far cry from the $40,000 initial award. And I'll tell you about this kind of case so that you understand when you see uh, news headlines about a huge jury verdict or a huge trial court award, you understand that the end result of that case, especially after an appeal, may be much lower than that large amount that was initially awarded. So Petco case got cut significantly. Uh, here's one of those headlines. Central Texas woman awarded $47,000 in Schnauzer's death. Another pretty clear case. The uh, dog ran away when it got away from pet store owner and was killed when it was run over by a car. Um, here's a case out of Kentucky where the owner of a German Shepherd received $15,000 after the Shepherd, I shouldn't say received, the jury awarded $15,000 after the dog bled to death after surgery. Uh, and then lastly, here's one from California where the owner received an award of $28,000 because their Rottweiler had to have its teeth capped. Now I have a hard time figuring out how they came up with that number, but I, I suppose it may have been in large part attorney's fees. So you'll see headlines like this, and, and in these particular cases, I can't tell you what the end result is because I wasn't able to figure that out. Um, here's another one with really bad facts with a large award. The uh, uh, California dog owner sued veterinarians. He claimed the veterinarians uh, misdiagnosed the dog, uh, lied over a four-month period, uh, lied about the condition, lied about the need or, or the pers uh, prognosis for treatment, uh, and gave unnecessary and improper care. Now, I think part of what motivates this decision is the owner spent $20,000 in veterinary bills. So when the jury gets asked, the jury finds, okay, the dog is a mixed breed dog. It has a fair market value of $10.00 but we're going to add a special value of $30,000 because obviously it had a value uh, for the uh, owner to be willing to spend $20,000. Uh, by the way, the owner also reported that they spent more than $350,000 taking this case to court. 
So I don't know again what the end result was, but I suspect they received a, a, an actual amount somewhat lower than th the $39,000 and probably went through quite a bit of inconvenience. And, and this is why the courts, one of the reasons the courts struggle with this, uh, it doesn't make sense to spend $20,000 for the care of a dog that's only worth $10. Somehow we have to come up with a way that more accurately reflects the value of dogs. Now one last comment I want to make that that really covers the the topic of negligence. The uh, uh, four elements of the claims again are duty, breach of duty, proximate cause, and damages. Uh, I want to make a real brief comment. If you are involved in farm animal activities or livestock shows in Texas, uh, we do have a statute in Texas that may reduce the risk of your liability to uh, other people participating in the farm animal activity. It requires that you have a warning notice. It can either be posted or in your written contracts. I recommend you put it in both places and it has to be in this particular language that's, that comes out of the statute, out of the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code, uh, th to notify the participants that you may not be liable uh, for their injuries. Uh, it applies only to farm animal and activities and livestock shows. It does not uh, apply to other activities. Some of the risks that you may be protected from include the propensity of animals to behave in ways that may result in damage, injury, or death, uh, the unpredictability of the animal's reaction, and the potential of a participant to act carelessly in a way that contributes to injury. By the way, participant is defined as including people who are assisting in providing veterinary care for their animals. Uh, so it can, that kind of notice can give you some protection and there actually is a Court of Appeals decision out of the Fort Worth Court of Appeals where the court applied uh, this statute to protect a veterinarian from liability. Uh, the statute does have some specific uh, limitations. It protects you only if the injured person is a participant. If they're just a spectator, it doesn't apply. It doesn't apply if the injury is caused by faulty equipment or tack. It doesn't apply if the uh, veterinarian fails to make a reasonable and prudent effort to determine the participant's ability, if the injury is caused by a dangerous latent condition of land, or willful or wanton disregard for safety, intentional acts, this is probably the biggest exception, this last one is probably the biggest exception, it does not apply to activities regulated by the Texas Racing Commission. So, of course, activities like horse racing, you don't have this protection from liability. So I really just want to make that point to you about that statute so that if you are involved in uh, farm animal activities or livestock shows, you know that this is one extra step you can take that may help protect you from some liability. So with that, I'm going to conclude the second part of this lecture. Thank you very much.